I said, you mean like even a year from now, if I'm still living in someone's spare room and I can't pay my bills and I'm riding the bus? And she goes, yeah. And I go, I'm going to commit a massive, massive fraud. And I'm going to leave the United States. Six million dollars still unaccounted for in Cox's case. And we like that money back. And then the, narr the, the narration is, you know, it'll be a long time before Cox can go to his Cayman Island account. It's like, who said Cayman Island? What are you doing? You know, <laughs> so they, they do this whole thing. And as a result of that, my, my ex-wife, she used to come see me when I was locked up and she would make these cracks. Like, you know, I know, you know, I know you've got money out there. I know you've got money. I go, this, the, this, I go enough with, I'm not talking to stop, stop. And one day I pulled up to her driveway just after I got out of prison, got out, pulled a shovel out. She sees me. She goes, what are you doing? Nothing. Don't worry about it. I start digging in her front yard. <laughs> hey, this is Matt Cox, and I've got uh, an interview with uh, two really interesting guys. Uh, one is Tim. The other one is Lance from Crawl Space. Got uh, a program called uh, Missing, where they find missing people documentary so there's a bunch of cool stuff and i appreciate it so uh check this out you guys i i had, I had seen your episode on uh, jane and the i want to say the riverside um uh, killer but is that right so close so river. close it's the uh, connecticut river valley river killer valley. is yeah. what most people call it it's a little misleading because it is not located in Connecticut. So the Connecticut River runs the border of Vermont and New Hampshire. So these murders took place between 1978 and 1988 in this section, kind of central Vermont and New Hampshire. And that area between the borders called the Valley. Okay. Okay. So what well, probably the newspapers start started it and it just took off like D.B. Cooper. Um, oh, why? Right. Nice with the DB Cooper. I know, right? But <laughs> yeah, it's the same it was. Thing. The like they said DB Cooper, and it's not his name was not, you know. Um, yeah, you're right. You're yeah. right in the sense that I think it. Yeah, it was media created. Um, I love how into DB Cooper you are. By the way, I, it just happened to come up twice. It happened this and the last <laughs> one. Um. Anyway, I saw that episode, and there were there were several. Um. Well, I guess there were. Uh, Jane was a victim of his that you know that lived um and then i had jane on and then that kind of led to uh to me being interviewed on your program and now i'm interviewing you and i um uh so and then we spoke of course we spoke on the phone so now we're here and do you have do you have anything specific you wanted to talk about uh we had i know we kind of you know talked about it uh and you said you were gonna you had a couple different things you were interested in in cases you were working on is that yeah correct? yeah yeah and well now that you brought up the uh connecticut river valley killings and and jane so jane borowski was the last known attack victim uh, we are producing with our colleague jennifer amell uh a a new podcast called dark valley and that's going to be jane's story her attack how she is connecting herself with the other victims and trying to tell their stories as well. She's a remarkable, you know, I mean, she's a remarkable person. Right. Uh, she's a great like force of nature and her attack is just uh, harrowing. The fact that she survived that is, is incredible. So um, that was just a, just a quick promo. And that was a shameless plug for dark Valley That's coming out spring of uh, 2023. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so uh yeah it's but there's no link or anything yet oh so. yeah you can subscribe oh, to the yep yep it's live on any um anywhere you listen to podcasts and you can uh subscribe the trailers there and we'll start dropping some um some more like promotional stuff uh after the new year okay well i mean send me any links and i'll put them in the sure. description you know for sure not that you know i think you know some of the like some of my videos get, you know, five or 10,000 views, some get 20,000. So you just, you never know. Some will shoot, some get a hundred thousand, who knows? So, um, but, um, so what are we, uh, what are we going to talk about? What's going on? Well, whatever you want, really. I mean, I sent you over a, a couple of cases um, that the that the nonprofit private investigations for the missing has been working on their active cases um, that are being run by private investigators 
uh, affiliated with PIs for the Missing, this nonprofit that we're, in the, we're on the board of. Um, so there's a couple of those we could talk about. Um, we can get get into that a little bit if if you'd like. It's really uh, it's really your call. Yeah, um, that that sounds great. I don't, you know, okay. I actually only only link I ever got was like a week or so ago. I would gotten just a link to the website. I don't recall getting another link. Okay, no, that was it. That was it. Um, yeah, there's, there's just, uh, I just put a couple of names down there. The, uh, the website is investigationsforthemissing.org. And, uh, this nonprofit was founded in 2018 by Bruce Maitland. And Bruce is the father of Brianna Maitland, who went missing in 2004 from Montgomery, Vermont in, uh, March of 2004. And uh, it's taken Bruce a long time to um, sort of turn his loss, uh, really kind of aim it at helping other people. And uh, PIs for the Missing has a lot of people who volunteer for it. And it really came together in an organic way and uh, really kind of just a beautiful way, to be honest. So what are, what are you, what are you uh, actively working on right now? I mean, as far as the uh, board is concerned, we will, there's, there's, there's missing persons that come to the, the nonprofit by way of the uh, tip line, the, the email address, and uh, we'll get this, these form submissions. So there's a process that happens. They'll go through the, the board, then the investigators who are volunteering their time will check it out and they'll start working uh, with law enforcement uh, to make sure that nothing that is going to be said uh, publicly, like through the the podcast missing, we can't have information going out there that are that's going to negatively impact any investigation. So there's a whole series of checks that it has to go through before these cases come to us, before these missing person cases come to us. And we do our best to then put together all of this information, all of the circumstances of the person's life, their disappearance, where the investigation is at now. If we have the opportunity to find a family member who can come on, then we'll have a family member come on. And those interviews tend to be obviously very powerful and they resonate a lot more than a you know, conversation just between two people who aren't really involved with this person on a, um, like on a personal level. Um, if we don't have a family member, then we cover it through the researchers. So the case will start at the uh, investigators, start with the investigators, and it'll go to the researchers who will dig in as much as they can, contact as, as many family members, as many friends. They will find as many articles that's written on it, and they'll put together this research document that will be delivered to us, and then we'll work off of that. So it'll be Tim, myself, our, our colleague Jen, and we'll record an episode where we work off of this document after we've perused it for a while and become really familiar with it. And I mean, when you say, <laughs> I know your question was, what are you working on now? Everything yeah. all at once. I mean, there's a working drive, a working folder that has all of these cases, all of these missing persons that just is constantly being updated. And we have a lead. I, I mean, Lou is sort of the lead investigator at PIs for the Missing. He's been in the law enforcement. Um, I don't want to say business. He's been in law enforcement his whole life, like his whole professional life. For the most part, he was a chief. Uh, he was chief of police in a town in Massachusetts, and he pretty much controls the investigative part, but he'll deliver, I think it's like once a month, twice a month, he'll deliver like case updates. So we basically operate off of that. Um, and then they're the ones that just like stand out, like Erica Franilich, Brianna Maitland, who's Bruce Maitland's daughter. Uh, she's not, I mean, they're all still, they're all still missing. Uh, Brianna Maitland, Eric Franilich, um, those are those are two that that stand out now. But what we have been working on, I mean, <laughs> what, what are the ones? So why do those stand out? Oh, you know, because like I'll, I'll just use Erica Franlich for an example because they're totally solvable. They're totally solvable, and you you can you know what happened. You 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 hear the circumstances. You hear from the investigator. You hear from family members. You hear from witnesses. Like 
yeah, this is what happened. The this what? individual was being beaten by her husband, and then she suddenly decides to leave her children and her husband by just hopping on a bus and never never heard from again. So it's like, okay, kind of kind of get what happened. So yeah, the ones that stand out are the ones that are really solvable. Yeah. Um and and okay, it's, I was gonna it, say, so this so they go back they've they've the investigators have kind of re gone over all of the do they actually go out and re-interview everybody or they just go over like the uh the police reports so it depends um the cases that are run by private investigators like the case lance mentioned erica franilich um that one does have a pi assigned to it um, some of the, some of the ones that we cover on our podcast missing don't necessarily have that element. If they do, um, you know, you'll hear from the PI on, on the podcast, uh, at some point when it, uh, is beneficial to the case, right. if that makes well, sense, because yeah, that's one of the investigators, uh, tools. Um, we are, we are a couple of tools, Matt. And, uh, and we don't mind I was uh, just thinking that, <laughs> um, well, I, I, I was, you know, it's, I was just, you know, I, I, it, it's funny because I, I wish I could remember the circumstances, but this was not a few hours ago where I was talking to shoot. I wish it was, I wish I could remember who it was, but somebody was, was missing and we actually were talking about it and oh i know what it was somebody uh my my um a buddy of mine had seen a TikTok, and the woman was screaming about how her no wait it was i'm, I'm sorry it was my girlfriend was it, it was a facebook thing where a girl was talking about how her mother was gone the police don't want to help her and she's been gone for like nine years and she doesn't know what to do and this and and, and i was thinking to myself and you know i actually and i said you know you know, like I get her being upset, but you get to a point where it's like sometimes, you know, the there's just unsolvable. I'm not saying, you know, like like, you know, you like you said, you know what happened, but the police can only do so much. And you get to a point where this person, you know, this person is missing. And of course, the police are always like, look, you know, either she's deceased or she's left and doesn't want to be found. Okay, well, you know, that's doubtful since you've got a daughter and, and grandchildren and, you know, friends and family. And you're going to reach out to, you know, even if it's dangerous for you, you will most likely reach out to somebody for some familiarity in a, in a moment of weakness. Um, you know, and I know that just from being on the run and it was dangerous for me to, to you know, I could have been arrested and incarcerated for contacting someone. It could lead back to me, mate, possibly. So, yeah. So, I know that most likely they're deceased, but then it's like, how much can the police do? They they think this person, you know, may have harmed uh, the missing person. But, you know, if they they don't have anything, they don't have anything like how, you know, I think initially, initially, obviously, they do the investigation and everybody kind of, you know, clamors up and, you know, and then it's a matter of like a lot of these things get found, got get solved, like over time, people start talking. You know, or a new investigator comes and sees it in a different manner and, and happens to go along a different track. And next thing you know, the whole thing blows open. And so yeah. I mean, is that's kind of the the goal for you guys is like somebody time, you know, yeah. time is going to, uh, you know, uncover something or somebody's finally going to say, look, you know, I didn't say anything for 10 years, but I'm going to tell you and they find a body or or maybe she's discovered and yeah. I don't know. No, I think you're right though, that you're you're hitting on one of the the main elements um of why PIs for the missing jumps in to take on a case is uh is time. And that that's one of the ways uh, a case can can be solved. Um so cases that eventually become cold are the ones that PIs for the missing are interested in. Uh we haven't taken on any recent cases. Um and so when a P, when an investigator will jump in, they'll contact law enforcement and you know turnover there happens investigators retire people drop the case you know the case cases just fall between the cracks so those are the cases we want and then maybe when our pis uh go investigate these people who have probably been investigated or interviewed years before they might maybe something's changed maybe someone's died uh maybe maybe they don't want their 
here and their last name blasted around or a billboard in town um, with their last name uh, out there when, you know, there could be, there could be someone buried on their family property. Mm. I, I, I will say though, with time, if you are a perpetrator and you have done something to somebody and you've gotten away with it for 10 years, 15 years, I don't know, five, 10, 15 years, you've gotten away with it. And typically like that person's probably not going to be like, I can't live with this anymore. They're going to say, well, I'm just going to continue to keep my mouth shut. But somebody who knows that person will finally say, listen, I'm tired of being afraid. You know, I'm mm -hmm. tired of not saying anything because for whatever reason, this person has a, a certain hold over me and I'm not supposed to talk about what I know happened. So that helps. Uh, the billboards will help if you can strategically place one to motivate people to speak, not to law enforcement, to speak to private investigators, to speak to people who aren't cops. People often talk to non-law enforcement a lot more freely than they do, you know, law enforcement. It's easier right. for them. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Matt, I'm curious uh, from from you though. Um, your your past. I mean, you you really successfully went missing. I mean, we we talk about it, um, how hard that is to do, and it's like almost impossible these days. It seems to us, but I don't know. I feel like if anyone could do it, if if I know anyone who could do it, it's you. I uh, you know. I mean, I did it for three years. I know guys that went 20 years, but they, they typically left the United States, um, you know, and, but I mean, my biggest mistake was like, I had a few rules that I was told myself, you know, and what that main rule was, if anyone ever learns your name, leave. You know, nobody can ever know who you were, who, who you are. And that's what happened was the girl I was dating, you know, she found out who I was and because she knew who I was, she ended up confiding in a friend. That friend turned me in like, just like that, just like what I knew, you know, cause although I know she didn't want me to get, get caught, her friend was less likely, you know, or, or less concerned about that. And as a result of that, I, I, you know, I got caught and, and it was just, you know, me breaking, breaking that kind of rule that I had. And it was just, you know, and, and I, th I think that's difficult because I had built a whole life with her. And when she found out, it was like, you know, I was in love. I didn't want to start over. I was happy. Ugh, you know. And so she ended up telling, you know, telling someone and that person turned me in. You know, plus the other thing is publicity. Like you said, with the billboards and all these other things, like it's it's if they want to find you. They're going to find you. It's just how much how much resource do they want to put into it, um, you know? And it's you know it's expensive. Like you know, private investigators are expensive. Like even, and people don't realize like the police and their resources. They're like, oh well, they had they should do this. They should do that. There's only so much they can do before it's like, look, we're we're you're blowing a lot of money on a case that is very unlikely to be solved. And now you guys, even with you guys having someone, guys that are willing to donate their time, like that's a huge sacrifice for them. Private investigative work is, is extremely expensive. Like that's not like, oh, it's, I take a two hours on Saturday or something. You know, it, it's, it's like ordering, it's like going through writing an article, like the, the amount of work that goes into writing like a nonfiction book or article as opposed to a fiction book, you know, is vastly different. It's a lot. It's a ton of research. So a ton of reading documents. And um, so I, I can, I can, you know, so I think that's, a, that's like a huge sacrifice for these guys or, you know, to, to be donating their time. He served over a decade in federal prison for bank fraud. And he still owes the government six million in restitution, but he's good for it. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. Yeah, and the nonprofit is always in fundraiser mode. I, I think when we started this with Bruce, it was about assembling the team so that the inner workings could operate as seamlessly as possible. So people submitting a missing person would know that 
the communication internally was happening about the person that they submitted. So that was where the focus was like, let's make sure that people know that they're being taken care of. And it's all worked itself out on that level and sort of categorizing, here's the investigators, here's the researchers, here's the media part. And right now we're in that fundraising mode because, uh, or fundraising phase. And that's going to have to be like nonstop. You know, that has to be a department or, you know, has to have some some representation out there because like you said like the the, the pis need to at least get paid up for their expenses they need to get paid something that's that's primarily what it would be going towards is um operating expenses and and you know the services of a private investigator there's so many cases out there and not not nearly as many pis that we would like to have looking into these cases. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll have a really good system in place to raise funds for these, for these uh, individuals who are donating their time currently. I, I wonder, um, you know, I mean, this sounds, I don't know if this is, you know, um, pertinent or not. Well, I, I think, I think it is. I think if you could probably, not that you need my help, um, but like, doing like a TikTok where you you summarize the case you know throw some some highlights of the case some of the more interesting aspects of the case in a a little 2 minute TikTok and put it up and explain that you're raising funds like that that may you know that may be a huge listen there's there's all it, it's a it's amazing what people find uh, fascinating and that type of thing, something like that could, might be because it's so unique that may end up taking off. And that would, you know, and believe it or not, obviously, that would bring awareness, which would raise money. Um, yeah. So something to think about. Anyway, yeah. I was thinking about a case that there were there was a woman with her two daughters had come to Florida on vacation and met a guy at a gas station. This is back. I want to say in the 80s met a guy in, a, in the gas station and she, he struck up a conversation with her and said, Oh, you're here on vacation. Oh, okay. Well, he said, I, I have a, um, I have a boat and he did somehow or another. She wrote, he wrote something down for her and like a place to meet. And said, I'll take you guys on the boat for the day tomorrow. And like gave her a place to meet and a time. And she she ended up driving somewhere, you know, driving wherever it was. And she met him and they went on the boat. And he ended up, you know, raping her and tying up the two daughters and tied bricks to all three of them and threw them out into the bay. And they drowned. Um... Well, I remember that uh, that affected me. Like I remember hearing about it, hearing a documentary about uh, it was a document. There was a documentary about it. it. Might have just been an episode on something, but either way, well, they couldn't solve the case. Like this is they had nothing, but they did have the note, and they couldn't. You know, they they looked and they searched and they talked to everybody. And there was just nothing, and eventually, either it went cold. I want to say it went cold. Something happened. But eventually they took the note and they put it on a billboard and said, does anybody recognize this handwriting? It was that simple. And I remember when they said they were going to do that and I was watching the documentary, I was thinking, nope, nobody's going to recognize handwriting driving down I-4 at 75 miles an hour. Like that's never going to happen. The guy's ex-wife or ex-girlfriend said, called him up and said, that I think is my ex-husband's handwriting. And he used to do this and that and this. And he, you know, it definitely looks like his handwriting. And they were like, why? You know, she was like, why? And they said, well, wait, let's ask you some questions. Does he have a, does he have a, whatever, a boat? Yes, he does. Does he live in this air, this general area? Lives about two miles from there. Does he, is he a six foot tall white male? Yes, he is. Does he, I mean, they just went down the bop, 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 bop. Turns out they eventually grabbed him. And I want to say they gave him, you know, DNA or did whatever it was and, and grabbed him. And, um, I, I want to say he confessed or they found, 
I forget what the exact situation was. He ended up getting like the like the death penalty. When was this? I want to say it was in the eighties or nineties. Hmm. It Sounds was, familiar, and you saw it on a uh, documentary. Yeah, I'm also recalling seeing it fifteen or twenty years ago, but I'm pretty sure it was like I want to say it was two girls on vacation with their mother. And I definitely remember he took them out on the boat. And uh, and I remember it was a it was a scrap of paper and it was a handwriting that the ex girlfriend or wife recognized. And then years and years later, ten or fifteen years later, I remember hearing about him being executed. Mm -hmm. And it was in Florida, Jeez. for sure. It was in Florida. I'll have to look it up and do a little search and see if I can find it. But same thing. It was like it was like. An older case. It was a billboard. It seemed like a long shot. Mm -hmm. Just worked out. Yeah, yeah. You, you just never know. I think with uh, with that are stuff. You, are you, you guys looking for it? I think Lance is. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm looking for it, but then it reminded me of another case that we had, another missing person that we had uh, looked you into. Chillingworth, the that, no. Uh, that no, <laughs> no, 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 that is that, similar yeah, circumstance. The, the judge and his wife, yeah, right, yeah, they were thrown yeah. into the into the water, into the ocean. I think, um, yeah, that was a crazy case. I think that was Florida as well. Yeah, yeah, it was. This is a yeah. lot of bad stuff happens in Florida. <laughs> a lot of odd people. Yeah. Oh, it, there really are, and and it does have that kind of um, reputation, and. Um, now you've you've seemed to live uh, a lot in a lot of different places uh, around the country. What? Uh, I mean, why? yeah. Well, the FBI kept showing up. Um, so. <laughs> what? So why are you now in Florida by choice? Well, when I got out of um, when I got out of prison, my mother lived in Tampa. So you know, I wanted to come here and spend as much time with her as I could. You know, she cool. So, you know, and I got yeah. to spend about about two years with her before she died. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah well, so. that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. I used to live down in there near uh, Clearwater. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about an hour the, and a half. You know, mm -hmm. you, yeah. You remember, you know, the pirate cruise on Clearwater Beach? The pirate cruise? <laughs> what you, uh, <laughs> you mean Gasparilla? You mean? Uh, on Clearwater Beach, there's uh, there's a pirate uh sort of like it's kind of like a vacation thing like a booze cruise kind of uh oh, okay. called captain memos pirate cruise yeah if you ever hit up uh clearwater beach you'll see it okay yeah <laughs> sorry for the diversion no i i i it, I, you know, I think of pirates i always think of uh jose uh, gaspar and the gasparilla you know um a festival and the gasparilla uh, parade right um so can you think of any, do you have any uh, other cases what that you're, you know, working on or like what, yeah. any, any ones that you have more than some specifics on or? Well, I mean, we, we've recently interviewed, uh, we've had a couple of really tough interviews in the past, several tough interviews in the past few weeks uh, recently. Uh, just speaking to the parents, the moms of these missing individuals, uh, Anita King was the most recent one. That episode is actually out today. Her daughter, Pepita Redhair, uh, indigenous woman, is missing. And just such a raw interview. It's going on three years in March. So she disappeared in March, like March 27th, March 25th, mm -hmm. 27th. Yeah. Um, 2020. Uh, in 2020 and how and how did she disappear did she just go to work one day and nobody found saw her again or were there what was le what led up to the disappearance it's a bit unclear other than uh her her mom witnessed um abuse uh she witnessed her daughter um being abused by her uh her boyfriend at the time um so i think that's like he probably has some answers um has not uh obviously not given them yeah um, so she she goes to visit her boyfriend and her abusive boyfriend and she doesn't come back and that's where her mom's at that's her poor mom is like okay well where did she go and the boyfriend says i don't know my dad and i went went out and came back and she was gone 
Maybe she got sick of, uh, maybe she got sick of me being drunk all the time, something like that. And there's nothing she can do. I mean, the, uh, you, you'd mentioned, uh, earlier on in the conversation that police will say, you know, or people can go missing as adults. They have every right to go missing as adults. But these interviews that we've been having lately, like that's one of the common threads that we keep hearing is that police just keep telling family, hey, what more do you want us to do? They're an adult. They can go missing. It's like, well, there's a history of domestic violence here, too. You know, (laughs) did they go out and talk to the guy? Did they? Apparently once. Um, But I don't believe he's being considered currently as a suspect. I think uh, Pepita's mom um, believes that they they believed his story. And that Pepita just took off. But that's kind of just like a bullshit way to. Yeah, how old is it's she? It's an excuse. She is, um, what, Pepita? 30? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, She. I think she'd be 30, 30 yeah. this year. Yeah. She went, was 27 when she met, went missing. And she just, yeah. I mean, like people just don't take off and just disappear forever. Mm. You know, I mean, some not out of the blue like that. Uh, no. Well, I mean, statistically, let, let's face it, even if you threw in the bad statistics, it's yeah. just so unlikely. It's not like it's something you would you would, um, you know, lean on uh, as far as saying, well, this is the answer. Why? Well, it does happen. <laughs> yeah, it does. Sure. For one for one in a million people, somebody might decide I'm going to up and vanish. But hard, that hardly ever, you know. You know, like, was her bank account emptied? You know, has her credit cards ever been used? You know, telling me all of her friends are never seen it. You know, come on, she's right. deceased. So, so that's something that kind of like I, you know, obviously you guys, yeah, see, like that'd make a great TikTok. Like you get to show pictures, you get to. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We we've uh, we've been working on the TikTok game and and trying to get that out there because that is really a huge resource. I mean the what what did we hear that stat like more more uh people within a certain age range like what was it 12 to 17 or something like that yeah like they they are they're using tiktok as more of a search engine than google mm, really right. <laughs> which blew our Us minds too. Too. Yeah. That's, yeah. All, that's like the exact reaction we had <laughs> yeah it's a horrible search engine in my opinion but i don't know that much but um I was just thinking to myself, even if it got blasted out there and the police started getting phone calls, it might mm-hmm. force them to do something. Yeah. Or a sure. newspaper newspaper article. Yeah. You know. I mean, yeah, it, it was recently covered on the on the show Disappeared, which definitely helped. Um, you know, with with some awareness. It's definitely not a very well known case uh, up until this this point in time, uh, as far as I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tim gets fired up about a case where the main suspect is referred to as a good old boy. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I was I always Uh, like I always like hearing this. Yeah. So this is uh, the Jessica Stacks disappearance. Um, It's from New Albany, Mississippi. Um, I believe that's also around the same year. Uh, yeah. 2021. Yeah. Um, was it New Year's Day? New Year's Day. Sorry. Sorry. I'm looking here. Yeah. So she's been missing a couple of years. Um, she, yeah, she went missing on New Year's Day, um, 2021. And her boyfriend claimed that they went to, they, they went fishing. They went fishing at 6 a.m. on New Year's Day, New Year's morning in, uh, in like 50 degree weather. Um, and, uh, it's, it's really pretty inexplicable. There's a, there was a leaking boat and they moved on this fast moving river. They were apparently hunting animals from the river, from the boat boat with a gun. Uh, so it sounds, it sounds like some sick and twisted, like Mad Max scene. Um, but it, it doesn't sound realistic also. And it doesn't, it's not something Jessica did. We spoke to her mom, Kathy, and uh, the, that is not something that she did um, hunt uh, or get into a boat um, at 6 a.m. on New Year's New Year's Day or hardly any time. Um, and yeah, the sheriff in, in that county, Sheriff Jimmy, Jimmy, uh, 
Edward, uh, Jimmy Edwards, Union County Sheriff Jimmy Edwards called uh, Jerry Wayne Baguette, her boyfriend at the time, called him. Ah, he's just a good old boy. Um, that's what he told their mom, her mom. Just a good old boy. And, and there's do documented. Anything. Just a good old boy. Just a good old boy who, you know, on occasion will beat up his girlfriend. I mean, there's she, pictures of just, her. She just never came back. Right. Yeah. He says yeah. that we went off. We ca- I came. We went off and and she what fell in the water. What's no, well, no he doesn't no, even she, say that. She, she left the boat. She left the boat, went into the woods and never, never came back. Again. Yep. Yep. So, so uh, and it's not like your reporter missing. Did he go to the police immediately and say, oh, my God, my girlfriend, and I, can't, I can't find her. She she went in the woods. And no, no, I believe they showed up four like, days later. And he said, oh, like yeah, I thought that was weird. Pretty, uh, pretty much. I mean, I think it was like his kid's boyfriend um, called later that night, like, you know, 12 or more hours later or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. And there's pictures of her with bruises. Like her, her mom posts on social media pictures of her daughter saying this is what that animal did to my daughter. And she's it was consistent. So that's one of those cases where it's like. Someone does something so out of the blue. She would fish, but she wouldn't fish at 6 a.m. And New Year's Day, they're not they're not borrowing this boat that leaks. There was no paddle. They were using apparent allegedly using a shovel as a paddle. And then all of a sudden she needs to stop the boat so that she can leave. And then she's just gone. Yep, just walk, just walked off. There was some extensive searches. They found some really weird things in the woods, like where somebody would have sat down. They found her, I guess, her uh, wading boots, like her water boots or her rubber boots uh, that were cut. And he said that they, they had to cut them so that her calves wouldn't chafe. She was complaining that her boots were making her calves chafe. There was like what was the weird fuses like big fuses that were in uh in like the yeah. crevice of a tree trunk right just like just like shoved into a tree yeah um, very kind of battery or, or something like that yeah and then if you ever look at the picture of this guy her boyfriend he's the <laughs> i love making this joke he's the type of guy where if you were at a family cookout and he showed up you'd be like Ugh, that guy he right. just he's got a very punchable face well, I mean, I uh, feel like there was a shovel involved um, as far as the, you know, so uh, I think he throwing the shovel in there is telling. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Good. Good point. Yeah. Because the shovel was apparently used to steer the boat. Um, yeah. Which doesn't yeah. really. I mean, and I suppose you could do it, Shovels but are it's good not for everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, guys, the three similarities that about those three cases that we just spoke of, Erica Franilich, um, Papita Redhair and uh, Jessica Stacks all had um, abusive boyfriends before they went missing. Um, are there any are there any cases where for, I don't understand why these why, by, by the way, just as you were saying, and I mean, just. I don't understand like why these women will get abused and then go right back. And it's like, you know, like, 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 I don't know any, I don't know anybody that was in an abusive relationship where the guy straightened up and everything was okay. And he just never, like it progressively gets worse and it just never, you know, you don't know anybody that's like, Oh, you know, yeah, he punched me a f- couple of times, gave me a couple black eyes, but then he, he you know, it was a bad time and he's been better, good for the last 10 years. And I'm like, it just doesn't like, it's just not something that typically happens. So it always yeah. escalates. Right. It, it always escalates. And it's really something that is put into someone's, I guess, fabric. They're the, the way that they live. Basically, usually, the individual has seen their parents being abusive to each other. And those parents have seen their parents being abusive and they want to, in a strange way, help the person who's abusing them. And they go back because they feel like this is helpful in some cases. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think women in general want to fix the man. Um, you know, they think they're going to fix them somehow. 
that's probably not going to happen. Um, yeah, I think it's just hard to leave too. I think, um, a a lot of women in abusive relationships, uh, you know, when they try to leave, they're more at risk than when they're not, uh, trying to leave. Right. But Um, but like one of the, I think one of the cases you were saying that like, she didn't live with them, the, the guy, right. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure about Jessica Stacks. Um, I I don't think Pepita lived with her boyfriend. I'm not sure about that either. Yeah. But I don't know. It's just, it's so like uh, systemic and there's so many different elements and factors that go into why someone would do that to somebody else. And, you know, we, we always hear about the, uh, the, uh, like the, the, the aftermath of it, the person's missing or, you know, the, the body's found. Right. Well, I'm just going to say too, and, and it's always easy to, to, you know, hindsight's 2020, why this, why sure. that, why this, you know, it's always easy to say, why would you should have done this and you should have done, yeah, well, I didn't know it was going to end up like this. Um, it's, it's always, it's like watching a, a horror movie and they hear something in the basement and they, they're like going down to the basement and you're like, don't go in the basement. Don't go in the, basement. but the truth is in my house, if I hear, hear a noise in the other room, that's my house. I'm going in the other room. Even, mm-hmm. you know, if it's creepy in the middle of the night, it's like, what's going on in here? You know, it's just that every situation is different. Of course, you know, then of course I end up getting murdered and everybody goes, why did he go in that room? <laughs> um, so, uh, are there any, are the, are these like all women? Like you've got three cases that you're mentioning that are women. Like are, do men ever, I mean, are there any yeah. men that have disappeared? Sure. Yeah. Um, there's one case that we've covered pretty extensively, uh, the disappearance of Brandon Lawson out of San Angelo, Texas. Um, and he actually, um, went missing under circumstances where, he was, he, his car ran out of gas, his truck ran out of gas on the side of the road. So his truck is left on the side of the road and he's just gone. Um, but there's a 911 call and, and, uh, this has sort of been, I guess, uh, analyzed and, and overanalyzed probably, um, by the web community on the web salutes out there and us included, um, because he's on the phone and you can hear it, but he, you know, he's not really making much sense, but maybe he is, if he is, could he be talking about someone's chasing him? Cause that's what he's saying. He's saying someone's chasing me and he's describing some scene, you know? Um, but it does seem like he was recently found, um, out only like a mile from where he went missing. Um, on, on some properties, there was, a, a a great advocate for the case who led some searches and got some help from PIs for the missing in, uh, trying to locate Brandon via drone over that area. So they did some drone searches and, uh, the investigators from PIs for the missing helped out. But, um, ultimately it was a foot search that, um, probably found Brandon, uh, and this was only a few months ago, and I don't think there's any update, no official update from Texas law enforcement, but uh, I believe the like the description of the sneakers is the same. Um, so it's uh, generally believed to be Brandon, however, not, a, not exactly confirmation yet. So how was he found? Like, was he, I mean, buried or just pieces of him? Did, you know, the, uh, you know, wolves get him or, you know, animals or something? And, and as far as not being able to, you know, like ID him, like, I mean, there's DNA, they, you know, the mother, his mother and father's DNA have to be, you would think that you could ID him, they could ID him. Yeah. I mean, we've theorized about <clears throat> why they haven't officially said that this is him. The, the family has said, his parents have said, you know, we believe this to be Brandon, uh, how he was found, like the condition of his body is not really something that we're that aware of we know that there were bones um and we know that the area that was searched was really rough terrain as far as a lot of cactus a lot of overgrowth and and just really tough to maneuver around and was it a four-wheeler path that they just hadn't looked down yet i think it was like an all-terrain vehicle path that they hadn't looked down yet i remember that i think it was property yeah someone's probably yeah it was on, it was on private property yeah but i'm pretty sure it was like like a 
like an all-terrain vehicle path or something that yeah, they you might be right. gone down there. But yeah, it's it's a interesting thought exercise to like theorize why it hasn't been officially released as him. So could be a number of things. I don't know. Could be that the investigation is still open and they're trying to figure out how he died. Um, hmm. I was going to say, so, I mean, he's obviously, there was something, somebody was chasing him. I mean, he sounds, you said it sounds like somebody was chasing him. It's well, <laughs> based on what he was saying, it did, you know, but he was kind of all over the place, um, with what he was there saying. Were drugs involved. He was, he was yeah, all I over think, the place. Okay. I think so. Yeah. I mean, is it possible that he just wandered off and slipped and fell and harm, hurt himself and then died from the elements? I think, I think it's probably something like that. Yeah. Um, but this was like a big, big, tough guy, you know, like, so I don't, I don't know. It definitely could have been, could have been something, some animal could have been just a situation where he couldn't have gotten out of, um, that snuck up on him. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Very tragic case, but yeah, we, we definitely cover, um, men going missing, but yeah, the, you're right in that there are typically different circumstances. Like, the woman who goes missing who has an abusive boyfriend is um you know a lot more familiar to us uh you know i don't think we've had it on wh where a man is being abused uh and goes missing right yeah. that we've covered on the show no no usually the men have some sort of mental health issue recently we've covered several that have had diagnosed schizophrenia um, we've covered a gentleman, uh, Mike Montijo, who more than likely, was he diagnosed with PTSD? Oh, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as he served 20 years in the Navy mm -hmm. and did some, oh, I always forget the name of it. What is it? It's like not seal. It's, um, he was a submariner submariner. Yeah. <laughs> so pretty intense, like operations, I guess in the Navy and then he he comes out and he has PTSD. Uh, he starts self medicating with alcohol um, to the point where when he stops drinking, he he hallucinates. And I don't know that could have some earmarks of uh, him being abused as well, because that's true. Yeah, yeah. it's it's not one that we know. Um, oh, that being a fact, at least. Um, yeah, and you know the the wife has not done a uh or what what mike's family would describe as a good job in helping to find him or you know so so there is some shades of something like that there lance uh mm. for sure mm -hmm. yeah and well, i'm i was gonna say gonna... anybody who wanders off you know like if you wander off in the wilderness it's, it's not hard to die you know you can die from the elements you know you can die you can slip and fall you can i had a cousin who was rock climbing the day before his uh wedding slid down you know and, oh. and fell you know he just oh. you know and died i mean you know there's it was there, it was in los angeles i watched this thing where there was a there's a well-ridden bike path and a a mountain lion jumped on this woman and, and you know killed her so i mean you know that's you know that's um you know that happens like there's it's like it's <laughs> listen it's wilderness it's dangerous like always yeah. yeah it always cracks me up when these guys like there was a guy who like got out and tried to take a, a selfie of himself with like a bear behind him or something the bear jumped on him and, it, and you know killed him it was like what what are you thinking like this is dangerous like it's, people are are knuckleheads you know <laughs> people get lost in the woods and you know that you're you go out in the woods and get lost you know it's a big place you could be dead in four or five days or a week. Yeah. Think, or, yeah, or after like 10 days or something like that, there's like a couple of years ago, some woman went, mm. got lost and they found her like 10 or 11 days later. That was amazing. Yeah. That was yeah. a great story. Yeah. Hawaii. Was it, was it Hawaii? It was somewhere tropical. I, I think, yeah. I think you're right. Um, yeah, that's, it's, 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 you're lucky if you survive. He built some of the nation's largest banks out of an estimated $55 million because $50 million wasn't enough and $60 million seemed excessive. 
He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crimes, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. Man, we, we just talked about this, uh, this man, Colin Finnerty, who was also suffering from some sort of mental illness. Uh, probably, um, was it CTE? He was a college football star, tried to make it in the NFL. He was signed to, I guess, the practice squad of the Broncos? I think so. Yeah, I think um, he played for, yeah. Yep, yep. Broncos. Whose door is that? Nah, I, well, I'm at, I'm at, I'm at home. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably, you know, I'm sure that's, my girlfriend will come down and hopefully get it. Um, but but anyway, it was uh, Memorial Day weekend and he was with his wife's family and they were, you know, have at a cookout and for whatever reason at 930 or whatever time at night, it was, it was later at night, nine, 930. He decides that he's going to go fishing. He wants to go fishing and they drive him out to this river and he has a pontoon boat. And then he never, they, they have to, you know, search for him and they find him face down with, uh, they find him dead face down. And I guess the cause of death was determined to be pneumonia after he had, asphyxiated on his own vomit okay well yeah how okay yeah strange that it wouldn't be drowning you know i guess he slipped in after after he uh well, if you were sick why would you go out there to begin with it's not like you don't know you're sick no no, no i i don't think he was sick it was a combination of the anxiety this is what they were saying, the combination of him him getting lost. So he they find the boat. So he had like he had docked the boat. Or I, I guess that's the term. He went got out of the boat and was he made a phone call saying to his uh, to his brother, right? Or brother in law that he was yep. he was lost. He didn't know where he was. So he was the, they were saying the it was the anxiety uh, could have been the pain meds that he was probably addicted to at the time. And when they found him, he was face down, his arms were at his side, he was still completely dressed, and the pneumonia set in probably because his lungs got full when he when he was asphyxiating on the vomit. How long was he in there for? Not long. Yeah. I don't know, a day, a day or two. Yeah, yeah. But to your point, like, the, the <laughs> people, it's easy to get lost and and perish yeah when you go into the woods and that is i mean the guy obviously wasn't going in there to like harm himself or you know this wasn't a suicide that he wasn't doing he wasn't bringing a body in there you know like this was not a suspicious thing at all other than you know the reasoning for going fishing that late for just a short period of time when he wasn't like a, a big time fisherman but he certainly wasn't thinking, okay, my anxiety is going to cause me to vomit, which I'm going to choke on, and I'm going to fall face down, and then that's going to cause me to get pneumonia so fast that I die. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it it things can go wrong quick. Yeah. But, oh, know, yeah. What were those two, the, the two kids, the boyfriend and girlfriend that were doing meth and decided to go driving in the snow? I don't know, but that doesn't sound like a good idea. No, it doesn't they're... sound familiar, but yeah. Yeah, well, the, I mean, they ran out of gas. They got lost, snowing, got lost, driving down some, you know, some road, um, some, you know, rural road somewhere and got lost. Yeah. And it was snowing and it was night. And then the kid's phone went out of, you know, ran out of juice. He's calling. They called nine one one. They were trying to find them. He was like, "Oh my god, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. I can't believe this." Phone eventually runs out of juice, and I think they found him a couple of days later. And you know, they'd frozen to death in their car Ugh. on the side of the road. It's like terrible. You know, you you don't have to make. You know, if one stupid decision can you know go wrong, and it, I don't even necessarily know that it it you know that the they that they were on meth that 
was the primary cause of just a just being young and stupid and thinking, hey, let's go drive around. Like, I mean, you know, in the snow and then things just one bad thing after another. Well, you're, you're kind of nail, nailing another thing that we've talked about. We've talked about a lot. Um, and uh, w one thing is meth. Um, so if meth is involved in a disappearance, um, sometimes what happens, and in fact, probably most of the time, law enforcement, they don't take it as seriously um, if they find out that that's been involved. So we, you know, we, we end up getting some of those cases um, and it, it tends to be like in, in the case that you described, um, it's not necessarily the reason they were out there, but it certainly kind of assisted. Um, and uh, we work with a detective who volunteers for PIs for the Missing, and he's a former NYPD Missing Person Squad detective. And uh, he tells us, like, look for the vice. So if we're applying that, you know, and we know someone might have been high on meth the night they went missing it's like okay well if you did meth here maybe where would you be you know that's kind of where you start i think with uh with some with something like that a drug like that so what is law enforcement you think okay well they don't look into it as much because because drugs are involved because they figure what we're not it's not like a it's not like an upstanding citizen went missing this is a drug addict like they're on their own I Pretty think much. it might be a yeah, it might be a little bit of that. Like, well, what do you expect when you when you do something like that? Right. You know, that's kind of the attitude. And the communities that people like like the detective that Tim had mentioned, follow the vice. And if the vice happens to be meth, that'll lead you to some answer. So that that vice will typically lead you to the community in which that drug was acquired. And that those are probably communities that are marginalized and communities that are not considered a priority. So it all kind of folds into itself. And they may or may not go out of their way to answer questions to law enforcement also, you know? So Exactly. Yep. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. They show up at their door and knock on their door. They may, you know, claim her up pretty quick. You're right. Um, assuming they answer the door at all. Um, I was, it's funny, you know, like we were, you know, basically talking about like investigations and stuff. And I wrote a story called the, um, is it the source? Yeah, I think I called it the source. It's, um, it's called the source and it happened while I was incarcerated. I, I knew a guy in there who did legal work and he was doing legal work for another inmate. And during the course of that legal work <clears throat> with doing this inmate's legal work, the inmate was saying he was given a leadership role and that got him an extra 10 years. So he got 25 years and he got an extra 10 years because, because the government said he was the leader organizer of the conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And he said, I okay. wasn't, he said it was another guy by the name of, um, I want to say Jose Pata. And so the, my buddy, my source said, well, if we can prove, and, and he said, if we can prove now the, his client, his inmate client said, was saying the government lied about this because he believed that Pata was a CI. And so they were protecting him. And it, it just so happened that there was some transcripts where the government had said that Pata was like the leader organizer, if that makes sense, uh, on another case. So he said, if we can prove it's the same Jose Pata and that he was a CI, we can get the 10 years off your sentence. So you only have 15 years. Now, this guy had already done like nine years. So basically, he's almost leaving prison. Well, the guy said, well, let's do that. So they start investigating it. And he's like, yeah, the problem is we can't prove how do we we can't even prove this guy exists. And the name Jose Pata is a very common name. You know, it's like John Smith. Right. And, and, and this was in this is in um, California. Well, 
he says we'd have to prove, you know, we'd have to prove that he, you know, he was even the same guy and that he's alive and there's no way to track that guy down. And he's like, right, right, right. Well, maybe a month or two later, he comes, the one guy comes back to the lawyer, the, the jailhouse lawyer, the source, and says, what if Pata was murdered? He goes, well, he goes, what if Pata died? And he says, what do you mean died? Died like got hit by a car, died like two bullets in the back of the head died. He is like two bullets in the back of the head. And he said, can you prove that it's the same guys? Well, he said, there are newspaper articles that say it's drug related. And he says, if we can prove that, he says, did you have anything to do with that? He said, no, I didn't. I didn't have anything to do with it. So they call the police. The police come out, talk to the inmate. The inmate says, the inmate, the police agree that's the same guy. They show him pictures of him. He says, that's the guy. That's the guy I was getting my stuff from. That's the leader organizer. Well, then a few months later, while they're still doing the law work, the inmate ends up confiding in the source um, that he ordered the murder of Jose Pata. And he was incarcerated. So he's now in, he's now got him in, tied up in a, in a murder that he's doing because now the FBI comes in because now the FBI is tracking this guy down to the murder and the FBI comes in there investigating the source saying, you're doing his legal work. Do you know anything? And he says, listen, I, I can't talk to you. He was in California. He said, I'll, I'll get killed if I talk to you. Have me moved to Coleman, Florida, and I'll talk to you there. So they move it within a week. He's on a, he's on a transport from California to Coleman. He's about to start talking to the authorities and explain what he knows. And he doesn't just know. He, like, knows the phone that was used. They have the phone records. Like, he can tell them everything. Well, when they go to his U.S. attorney and say, when the homicide detectives go to the U.S. attorney and say, look, we want to talk to this guy, and if he helps us, we want you to let him out of jail. He'd already done, like, 20 years or something on his sentence. He was getting out in five or six years anyway. So you, they're really only knocking off a few years. Well, the U.S. attorney said absolutely not and actually stops the – homicide detectives from going to see him. So to keep the source in prison for a few more years, the U.S. attorney puts the kibosh on, on a homicide detect on a homicide investigation into the murder of this guy. And his, his, the source is my, my idea. My, my thought process is that the U.S. attorney doesn't care about some dead drug dealer. And that, right. Here, Here's what and and that's what he he's like, that's what I think it is, is like they don't mind killing that investigation because he he was he was in, he was a uh, working with the cartel. He's importing cocaine. He's a drug dealer. Well, here's the part that kills me is that he was killed in front of his wife and his two kids. Oh, and he was also a uh, Mexican. He was also here illegally. He was a Mexican. So what do you care about some some dead Mexican drug dealer? And here's what kills me is that when they, he was kind of, we were talking about, it, I was like, yeah, I get that. But he was shot in the head in front of his two kids and his wife. You know, you would think such a heinous crime you would want, you would want to investigate. And do you, do you remember when I told you guys that I had actually called the detective to speak with him? We talked about that. Um, yeah. Off camera. That was the whole thing. I called the detective and we talked for like 45 minutes. We talked several times. I sent him the, the whole investigation. He'd already read my story because my story, that story is on my website. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got, I think I've got two or 300 pages. I even have handwritten notes from the guy that ordered the murder. Mm -hmm. Talking about multiple murders drugs uh, like in, in his handwriting i mean it's it's a whole thing but but yeah that's the whole thing it was just some dead drug mexican what do they care you right think, right think that you would like 
homicide is the worst possible crime. Like yeah. everything pales in comparison to that. Oh yeah. God, yeah, man. I know. I'm always shocked when I learn about biases uh, that law enforcement has, or sometimes they're, you know, we find out like how petty they are. Like some some offices or people in law enforcement don't like us. <laughs> it's like, okay, like, uh, all right. I mean, well, nobody likes to be made to look bad. And and honestly, let's face like like most law enforcement, you know, they're just. It's funny. It's like that one percent that makes makes them look bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's always yeah. that one asshole that makes everybody look bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, I mean, we, we never try to make law. We know ne we never go have gone out of our way to make law enforcement look bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, know, but it happens sometimes. Well, it, it happens. And then I, I, I definitely think, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, you know, I definitely think they're over, you know, overworked, overworked, unappreciated, unappreciated in danger. Yeah. You know, there's lots of things that, it's very true. You know, and but the other problem is I think it also attracts people that you know that want to be in a position of power, you know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, you see these guys like just being complete jerks, and and it's like, you know, there's no reason to to go over the top. So yeah. um, but anyway, um, I was gonna say I talked to that detective and listen, his only concern, you can always tell, like the homicide detectives, that's like the cream of the crop as far as law enforcement is concerned, like those are the guys that get to like the top, like that's the top, that's the job they want. They love that job. They, um, and like I said, it, it homicide, you know, or murder, just, you know, everything else pales in comparison. And all, his only concern was, he's like, I, my only concern is trying to solve this case. And I, I'm not allowed to go talk to this guy. Like I can't go talk to him. That's so frustrating. Right. So, yeah. It was a it was a it was a bad situation. We do yeah. get along with some law enforcement, though. Oh, yeah. 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 I don't want to make it yeah. sound like we're all enemies all the time. We're not. I mean, we don't see it that way. I guess my point was it's just always weird to find out that they're like they got offended by something we said or an episode we produced or something's like, really? They they listened. You know, yeah. that always <laughs> surprises me at, at all. I, I'm always surprised when they review. When they leave us reviews. When they leave us oh. one star. <laughs> <laughs> like at least you can leave us three stars. <laughs> we actually were invited by the detectives in Saratoga Springs, New York. They are investigating the only unsolved homicide in that city's history with Sheila Shepard. And we met them at this conference in Albany and they asked us if we would want to basically check out the case file, do a couple of episodes with them. And we did. We did how many? Like five episodes with them? And I think more like seven or eight, seven, I think. Was it really? Well, it's all yeah. a blur. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we we took some cameras there. We did a little, you know, did a little like documentary style shoot that uh, you can watch on YouTube and or I mean, I mean, we, we, they just opened up the 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 door for us and and their boss had said, you know, basically pull out all the stops, like whatever you guys have to do to get this case solved. And for whatever reason, they're like, Tim and Lance can solve it. And they brought us in. Uh, <laughs> they didn't what happened? That. We solved it. No. We solved it. No, no, no just we kidding. gave it a lot of good attention. We spoke with Sheila Shepard's aunt. And we spoke with, of course, the two detectives. Um, yeah. Really great moment where they showed us the case file and they were going through the pictures and it was like the autopsy photos and it was like graphic and we're like, oh, OK. And, <laughs> and of course, they're fine with it. And then yeah. they look at us and they're like, oh, sorry, guys, we didn't realize that you don't look at these things every day. We're like, yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, little heads up would have been nice before seeing this. But uh, I think but, we did a good job. I think we did a good job giving them some ideas that they didn't have previously. I think so, too. Um, unfortunately, what, what ended up happening was we also did an interview with the original investigator. <laughs> yeah. Who was much more tight lipped. Um, and did not want to share information with us like the current investigators were cool with, you know, in their eyes, it's like, oh, this has been 40 years. 
you know, like what, what's the harm? And the original investigators like, no. <laughs> so we, we were sort of, um, given some stuff and then we had like, we couldn't use it. Um, and that was frustrating because I think some of that stuff was really like the stuff that web sleuths love to hear about. Like, um, someone that they thought could have been the killer had submitted a, um, like a newspaper, like a classified oh, yeah. ad, um, in the newspaper. And so they had some like clippings like that. Um, and that, and like, I, we don't know if that was from the killer or not. And I don't know if anyone does, but I think it was uh, theorized at the time that it could be. So they were like holding that stuff back. But in our eyes, it's like, well, this is the stuff that web salutes want. They're like, you put that stuff out there because, you know, they, they might do some digging that that might shake some stuff up. That might get this person scared if they know that stuff like that's out there. And uh, so sometimes you get that old school mentality and that new school mentality um, sort of clash. Well, why? I, I don't know. Why didn't. So, I mean, it's still up. It's still the police department's information. The old detective, like, why does he said, no, you can't show that. I don't want that shown. And they said, yeah, OK, don't show it. Yeah, he just wasn't comfortable sharing information. And he was actually surprised when the detectives, I think Tim asked the question about, you know, like you pointed out from the, <laughs> from the profile, you pointed like, out. That's interesting. You're like, this is interesting. <laughs> and the, the old detective looks at the new detectives and is like, what? Like how, how is this guy looking through our files? Like he, he didn't say that, but the look like definitely yeah. expressed like guys, because I mean, back in the day, there was no social media. There was no uh, like Internet web sleuths that that actually were making a difference, solving cases. It was all like very close to the chest type investigating. Don't say anything. And I mean, some of them just never get out of that. Um, well, yeah, that method, that mode. Um, that would be but like, I also think. Uh, I but but I also that, think. That, I'm sorry. That ahead. would be like saying, oh, I don't want to, you know testing for dna oh i i don't know what that is that's new i'm not interested in doing that that's not mm -hmm. how we do it well it's a new tool mm -hmm. right use this i understand it's different and it's it's uncomfortable but if it in the end it's whatever it's not like it's ruining the case it's it's another it's just another tool in, at your disposal so i think some of those things in that case file like those classified ads specifically were holdbacks from his era um, back in the eighties. So he didn't want any of that stuff going out because that stuff only the killer would know, you know? And so I think that was their thought. Whereas the new school, that was his thought, I should say, whereas the new school investigators are like, well, DNA is going to be what solves this case, not a holdback item from a newspaper clipping from 1982. You know what I mean? Right. So again, it, it kind of, those two methods clashed head to head. Um, new school investigators were willing to make that risk because they believe that, look, DNA is the only thing that's going to solve this anyway. Even if you get a confession, you know, uh, maybe it's not the killer. You know what I mean? Did they have DNA to compare it to? Yeah. Yeah, they do. OK, so they've got DNA, but they just they just now we just need a. It's funny because, you know, people like periodically, I think you got you have to. I wonder how the system works if like they run it and they tag it in the system to say, hey, if anybody shows up, it, it should link to this because people are constantly every time I've every time I've ever been arrested and moved from location to location, they take your DNA. They take your DNA. They really? I've had my DNA taken 15 times. How do they um, get your DNA? Is it like a swab? Yeah, it's just a swab. Yeah. Yeah, they're not pricking your finger or anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, you would think at some point, like that's if you actually did something horrible, every time that you, these guys, every time they take that, they have to be concerned. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it's always that guy that's, you know, about to get out on a DUI and gets arrested for a murder he committed, you know, 20 years earlier and thought for sure he got away with it. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's those new technologies that catch up with you eventually. Yeah. No, it, it, that's the same thing. There was a guy in Hawaii that had been on the run for, I forget what it was like 20 years or something. And one day uh, he got pulled over and they asked for a fingerprint for some reason. They just give us your fingerprint. 
and he gave him the fingerprint and a week later they arrested him. You've been on the run for 15 years or 20 years or whatever it was. You know, that's, that's the problem. Yeah. We just interviewed a wonderful woman and that episode is out uh, yesterday on Crawl Space, uh, Kristen Middleman from a company called Othram Labs and uh, DNA Solves. And they have this powerful, amazing new technology that is literally solving cold cases daily now. They are a young company. They've raised a bunch of funding. I think she said that they're the only they're the only company that is funded by the three departments in the government, like the Department of Justice, the Department of something like Department of Health or Human Services, something like that. And they're they're solving all these cold cases. And they just solved the um, Lady of the Dunes case, which is like one of the crown jewels of mysteries. You have like D.B. Cooper, like Lady of the Dunes was one of those mysteries that no one ever thought would be solved. She was uh, found murdered in Provincetown, Massachusetts in the 70s, and they identified her as Ruth Marie Terry. Ruth Marie Terry is yeah. her name. And they figured it out. They're piecing it together now. And now there's an active investigation to find out who her murderer is. This seems like a really uh, novel idea. Like, you know, you have this powerful technology and you have a group of people that are working really hard on solving these cold cases. And it's not just bringing answers to family. It's freeing up law enforcement from that problem that we keep talking about, which is they're backlogged. They're not, you know, they work too hard on these uh, new cases come in every day that have to be bumped down the priority ladder because a new case comes in and a new case comes in. These this organization, Authorum, is literally like taking the bulk of all of these and they're daily. They'll solve three or four now. I mean, they started off and it was like, wow, Authorum just solved this one. And then yeah. like a week later, you hear another one. And now it's like during our interview, <laughs> like she knew that the Lady of the Dunes was just solved as we were talking to her. Well, and Go ahead. What is what is the technology? And you said this new. What is it? Is it AI? Is it a, a software? Software? What? It's twenty three and me. Just kidding. Well, <laughs> no, you. Um, so their site is DNA Solve. So they're building their own database of civilian uploaded um, DNA profiles. So that's one thing. They're asking for everyone's profile. Anyone who's gotten their DNA through twenty three and me, I guess you can uh, upload your profile to DNA Solves. Um, but I think what's so special about what they do is they're they're only working with law enforcement. So they'll get a piece of something, you know, and they'll get the DNA from that. And then they're also investigators to some degree. And they work with law enforcement to sort of, I guess, work backwards. Like they do the investigative uh, genetic genealogy part of it. So in, in the case of uh, Ruth Marie Terry, um, like, you know, I guess I, I, I don't actually I don't really maybe that's a bad example, but. They, they will sort of like if they get a piece of DNA, they will work in genealogy and, and people's family trees. Essentially, they'll, they'll get way up in your family tree and <laughs> essentially number it down to who who it could be. And then they hand that over to law enforcement. It's like so that DNA from that you submitted to us is from, you know, one of these few people. And their okay. their technology is essentially a beefed up um, sequencer. Like they'll sequence the DNA. Right. And it's just faster than than the way uh, state labs have run um, historically. And, uh, you know, even we're still seeing it, you know, like they're just, yeah, it's it's great that they're sort of uh, taking some on so many cases now and they are funded by the government now. Um, so, yeah, I do think there's going to be a lot more ladies of the dunes uh, type discoveries um, from Othram in the next few years. Nothing's off the table, like Zodiac and things like that. Like all that stuff's on the table um, if there was DNA solved or uh, saved, I should say. Yeah. Oh, my God. Right. She was even talking about like how little DNA they need. They need like, I, I honestly, like when she spoke, 
when you hear the episode, it sounds like Tim and I come right in after, but that's only because <laughs> like the gap after she stopped speaking was too long to keep because we were processing. We were like a minute behind what she was saying because huh? she, <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's, you know, she's, <laughs> she's a scientist and she's very well spoken, but she did give a fact about like when you touch your hand to another thing, like you leave a certain amount of DNA right. and they're able to pull like, even if it's 15% of that initial touch, they can pull in sequence, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, I've, I've, I've saw one of these programs where somebody had, he had, he'd end up, he had killed a, he killed a woman in a store and he grabbed a towel to wipe something off and put it down. He didn't leave any DNA, you know, you, you wouldn't think, but they said, well, we know the killer touched this towel. And so they said, yeah, he just left some some skin and some sweat that he had on the towel. And they then multiplied it enough to be able to test uh, test it. And then that was it. They, they ended up tracking him down. And they, they got him. That was it. Um, yeah. it's, it's amazing. Uh, but well, so so what are you guys doing right now on uh, Crawl Space and, and this documentary you're working on? Well, uh, let's see. So we interviewed you yesterday. Uh, so that's one one thing that's coming out next week. <laughs> coming out next week. <laughs> yeah, um, I saw the you know, I we, saw the um, the thing on was it Instagram? Yeah, yeah, TikTok yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, that came oh, out pretty good. Yeah, I saw it on Instagram. It just oh, okay. oh you sent it to me. Uh, I put it. I, I think we tagged you on Instagram, okay. and it and it goes to your DM. The DMs you automatically. Right. Um, but are you on TikTok? Yeah, I've got a couple different channels. I have, uh, um, it's a. Uh, I want to say it's Matthew Cox. What's the name of my TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> Jess. Why? Oh well, she's not. She's not paying. <laughs> Hold on, I have. I it. think I searched for you yesterday and couldn't find you. Well, I have one that's called um, "Inside the Darkness." It's got like eighteen thousand subscribers okay. uh, and cool. then i have matt cox is it matt cox what did they what did this guy name it crime c-r-i-m matt cox is it matthew cox crime or matt cox crime there are, uh, were a couple guys standing oh yeah yeah it's I here it. yeah. The one. there you are yeah matthew uh matthew cox it's at matthew cox crime oh, great Sixty thousand followers yeah great yeah it's very it's, cool it's got it's pretty uh there's a bunch of some of these have like a million 1.9 1.3 million yeah yeah nice yeah. that's cool okay that's great. so yeah you know um i'm almost constantly getting kicked off off of tiktok <laughs> yeah yeah Why? you know the stuff because this you know there it's all crime related stuff and yeah. so they're constantly saying you know you gotta strike you gotta strike you gotta strike you know <laughs> they're arguing about it. it's a i've got one of my a guy that watched my channel who who runs it um, for me and, uh, he's, you know, he's great. Um, but you know, it did pretty well. It got up to like 55,000 and then it's dragged since then. I think it's now it's a little over 60. So it's mm -hmm. still growing. Yeah. So who, yeah. who do you, um, see yourself? Who do you see playing yourself in the, uh, Netflix series? Stop. stop. <laughs> Tim and I, Tim and I were going back and forth yesterday. We have how many versions? We have a young version of middle age version and, and the then old, your future version and then my current version the old version no 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 we, we have someone much older yeah uh, mind. i think the current matt cox uh would be played by joaquin phoenix yeah it's gotta be <laughs> where's my girlfriend um i see <laughs> um oh my god i i always say i'm like well it doesn't like i can't it can't be anybody that's taller than like five six five seven or if he is taller than he everybody else has to stand on like a box <laughs> yeah, right. like Always. they do with uh, um, like yeah. like Tom Cruise has to do in his movies, but it's the other way around. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. So, or what? It, yeah. Um, younger so, you, I thought younger you could be. Um, am I pronouncing him right? Ter Terran, Teron, Egerton. I have no idea who that is. He played. <laughs> uh, he played um, Elton John in the uh, Rocket Man movie, and. He also played. Did you see um, Blackbird? I think it was no. Apple TV. No. He. I forgot the name of the his character and the character. He, he. It was a true story about a guy who went to jail for. Um, it was. 
maybe like light drug dealing or something. And he was offered a deal to coerce a confession out of a serial killer. He was transferred to this like maximum security prison to infiltrate this guy's existence and coerce a, uh, um, coerce a confession out of him, like where the bodies were located and both performances, him and the, the guy who plays the killer are phenomenal. Like it's a, it's such a good show, but he's in prison. And, and when we were talking, I'm like, yeah, this, that's a younger version of Matt Cox right there. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I had, listen, you know, the, the problem is, is like, uh, look at like, uh, Jordan Belfort the, for the yep. Wolf of Wall Street. Like, you know, he was played by Leonardo DiCaprio. Like they don't look anything alike. Like what do you, yeah. you know, so it's it never ends up being a guy that's really close to they they pick who they want. So that's true. I was, you know, and and also the other thing is like you know who I think I look like. You know, I think I look like Brad Pitt. Every my girlfriend disagrees. I can see that. One hundred percent. She's listen. Don't get crazy. Okay. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, but yeah. So um, you know, I I I don't I don't. I don't know. You guys are cracking me up. I think the Joaquin <laughs> Phoenix is pretty spot on. I think older, I mean, older Matt Cox is Michael Douglas. I'm, I'm so like, oh my God, listen. Yeah, that works too. My, my mother used to say all the time, You look like Michael Douglas. Did anybody <laughs> ever tell you that? You look like Michael Douglas. I'm like, Mom, Michael <laughs> Douglas is old. Well, the younger Michael Douglas, but not too young because you're not, you're not that young anymore. <laughs> So but, that was an amazing impersonation of your mom. Oh, my mom was, was my mom was a gangster. She was hilarious. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, she was funny. She was, uh, you know, the, the Catholic, you know, are you guys uh, like the Catholic mother is just like the Jewish mother, you know, yeah. She's, you know, oh, are you um, are you growing a beard? Are you growing a beard? <laughs> no, mom, I just haven't shaved in a, in, in a couple of days. Oh, OK, well, then. Then you should shave. <laughs> you know, she'd say, Are you, do you want me to buy you a collared shirt? I go, no, mom, I have collared shirts. You don't wear them. <laughs> I'll wear a collared shirt the next time. It was just bam, bam, bam. Are you growing your hair out? You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no mom, oh, you I should get a haircut. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe you should. I, should. I need a haircut. Well, maybe you should do that. So. I'm, no. I have a question for you if you don't mind sure. when you when you were released in 2019 you started your youtube channel and you started the show how much how much technology like how how aware of that are you when you're incarcerated like because oh, you no. i i so i really didn't start for probably over probably i i didn't start for a year i started doing this about two years ago where i should have started like as soon as I got out of the halfway house, I should have started. And the worst thing is, is that this guy, you know, Danny with concrete, I did a, a video with him and it got like one guy, like in the, and within a couple months, it had over a million views. I had over a thousand subscribers on my channel before I ever posted a video. Just guys were just subscribing. They would find me and subscribe to me. And you're trying to get you to start putting up videos. And, and Danny told me, your, your video's blowing up. Your story's going to blow up. You need to take advantage of this. You need to start posting videos. And I was like, I don't, why would I post videos? I'm like, I don't know. I don't have the equipment. I don't have any money to buy the equipment. He goes, you have a cell phone. Oh, I know, but it'll look like crap. He goes, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter. He goes, put something up. Start posting once a week. Talk about anything you want to. People are fascinated by you. There's Hundreds of thousands of people every month watching your video. And then by that point, I'd done like one or two others. Like I did valuetainment that got over a million. I did soft wide undervalue. So within a six month period of time, I had three videos that were all getting hundreds of thousands of views. And I was just, you know, I, I was super intimidated by the entire thing. Um, like I can turn my camera on. I can, I can work it. I can put it on the, you know, the, put it on the card. I can insert it in my computer. I can edit. I know Final Cut Pro inside and out. Like, like, you know, obviously you guys heard earlier, like it's the little settings. Like you went in and changed something on my camera. What did you change? I don't know what that is. <laughs> There's like 40 things you can change. I don't have time to figure out what you did. 
So, you know, which is, you know, I called a, um, a Connor and, and was asking him. So, but I waited too long and it was, I was too uncomfortable and I should have started. And as a result of that, I missed a massive wave that I was on. And as a result of that, I missed it. And, and so instead of me ending up with half a million subscribers, you know, I've got what 50 coming up on 60,000 subscribers, because by the time I started posting and got everything the way I wanted it, you know, that that was on my way down as far as the algorithm used to be, if I, I needed another a wave, there may be, yeah, there may be, but look, this is, you know, and I said this on, on your show and I've said this, you know, I say this all the time is that like, I have a great life. You know, I just have, a, I just have a great life. Like to me, people in my comment section, they're always saying, you know, why, bro, why hasn't your channel blown up? Why don't you have more views? Why aren't your, well, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a grind, but I'm doing yeah. better than I was yesterday. I'm doing better than most. I enjoy mm -hmm. doing the videos and I can pay my bills. So I don't have an issue with the way things are going. I th I'm thrilled. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say you're doing great. Like for yeah. uh, like, like you've uh, really, really uh, amassed a large following. I would say I, I would definitely not look at this uh, as a missed opportunity in any way. You've uh, you've made a lot out of um, out of your stories uh, and you've got a big following. Um, but you're right, though. It's always getting bigger. You know, tomorrow it'll be bigger than it was today. Yeah. And and honestly, something could happen. Just, just like you said, you know, yeah. who knows? Who yeah. knows what happens? So I just want to be clear that when you were incarcerated from 2006 to 2019 for 13 years, right? right. That was that was a huge time in technology. I mean, everything blew up during that time. When you were in in there, you you didn't have access to anything like that, social media, anything like that. So no, you, you have computers. So yep. like if I wanted to email you, like here's the thing about like the federal system, it's way behind. Like most states, you can get tablets. You can get all of these types of things, right? Well, you have a computer, you have like four or five computers for 180 guys in every unit. So 180 guys, you got five computers. And what that computer consists of is I can log on to assist to the system and I can send an email to what's called CoreLinks, the CoreLinks website. And then if you're signed up with me, you can go on, from your computer at home onto CoreLinks and retrieve that. Then you can send me one back. Then I can go on. And, like, there's no internet. It's like a communicating through, through a, um, I, I don't even, I don't, it would be a, doing a huge disservice if I were to say through um, Instagram or Facebook or me Messenger. It's, it's similar, but you can't send pictures. You can't send screenshots. You can't send, it's all, it, it takes about a two hour delay from one to the other. It costs me money as the inmate. So there's no internet search. There's no, I get to use the phone about 10 minutes a day. So you get 300 minutes a month. So that's basically a 10 minute phone call a day. And let's say I talk to you for 10 minutes and I hang up the phone and I thought, oh, I forgot to tell him something. Um, you know, I'll let me call Lance back and I pick up the phone. I can't use the phone again for an hour. And then, of course, oh, you, wow. have to stand, yeah. you have to stand back in line. So you stand in line, you wait, you might wait 15 or 20 minutes to get back on the phone. You pick up the phone. And if you don't answer after I call a couple times, you basically have to get up, get off and get back in line. <laughs> because oh, the yeah. guys aren't going to say, you know, it's so, yeah, there's that's, no there's no that's even know. more impressive to me that you came out and went right into it and amassed the following you did without. Well, in fairness, Lance, he doesn't know what the ISO is on the camera. So. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I, no, it's just, uh, it's just true. In some ways, I've made a huge leap. And in some ways, I'm like, you know, it's. Yeah. People start no. talking and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, nice I know is, it's impressive. I have to say it is impressive. It, the nice thing is, is that, you know, I'm okay with admitting that I don't know. I know lots of guys that just, you know, oh, I, don't, I don't mess with that. I don't mess with it. why. Cause you're uncomfortable because it creates anxiety because you don't want to look stupid. I don't mind looking stupid. I don't mind saying, listen, bro, I don't know. I don't know. Help me. Mm -hmm. 
tell me how to do this. And then a lot of guys are like, I have an assistant that helps me sometimes. She'll just go here. Just give me the phone. I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want you to get, I want you to show me what you're doing. I want to do it because I can't keep calling you. I need to know. Hmm. And I think that that was a huge, for me, that was huge because um initially i was like just do it and then i realized after six months no you can't do that you can't do that you have to learn as uncomfortable yeah. as it is you have to force yourself to learn this you know which is horrible um <laughs> so yeah, for, especially for somebody who wants to be in control of everything all the time you know which is like an, an issue for me i want things my way were you so, were you like that before you uh went into incarceration yeah, I was. I, I, well, kind of, but I mean, I think I'm a little bit more um, OCD now. You know, hmm. like I, I hate clutter. Like if you saw my, like the, I have two areas in my living room. And I still have a living room. I live in a nice big house, but so I've got two studios. But the, the fact that there's multiple cameras with cords running all over the place, it's killing you. It, it, it bothers. I, I don't even really look over here. Luckily, my girlfriend is worse than me. So like the bed's always made, the pillows are in the right place. All, the clothes are always like she's very, um, you know, very, very OCD. Everything has to be in a certain place in a certain way. So we get along, you know, great. But like this one section of my house, I just have to completely ignore. Yeah. 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 Do you when you're putting your dishes away, do you rotate dishes? I, you know, my girlfriend's in charge of all that. Ask her. I mean, not now. I'm, I'm just curious because I do. I mean, you don't want to eat off the same stale dish every single time. So I don't know. The ones that come out of the dishwasher go to the bottom and broke it. Did you ever see Sleeping with the Enemy? Yes. Oh, I love that movie. <laughs> it's a great movie. It was great. Yeah. yeah absolutely. The, you know, the cans in the cupboard. Yeah, yeah, when yeah. she opens up the cupboard, my I remember getting goosebumps. Whoosh, shot up my whole. Like, oh. Isn't that amazing that that they can make that moment so effective? She opens yeah. the cabinet and it's just cans. Yeah, and it's cans so scary. Facing like, front, <laughs> cans have never been so scary before in in the history of the world. Um, but speaking of movies, Matt, uh, after we interviewed you yesterday, it dawned on me that you remind your story reminds me of Catch Me If You Can a little bit. Yeah, I've I'm heard sure that. You've, you've heard that. Con yeah, that comparison, um, because you seem to be able to figure out uh, all the ways that whatever the people in the system have going on, like that there are like little loopholes that you can find, you know, that other people can't find. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I I definitely am. I'm super uh, inquisitive. And I, I remember, do you remember we, we talked about the um, um, the manager that told me to white out the 30 day late? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's funny. I used to drive her nuts. Like I would walk in, I'd say, hey, listen, I've got a client. I, um, she's married. Here's the, she works. She this. And I'd go through the whole scenario and she'd go, no, you can't. The most she, she can get is 80%. I'd go, okay. And then I'd leave. And I'd come back, I go, okay, here's the thing. Her husband gets social security disability and he this and he that. And she's go, what's his credit look like? And I go this and this and she go, no, it's not going to work. Okay. I'd leave and I come back. Well, wait a minute. Here's the thing. And I get, and she was like, she would get furious with me because she's like, you know, I kept altering what I was, you know, the, I kept altering the, I don't know what, uh, factors or the, the variables trying to make the deal work and you know and and she was like you're the only one that does that but then again i also was like the only i was also closing more loans than anybody because mm. i was like i know there's a way to arrange this so that it, it, it will work you know we've got two people here that both create income and one of them has you know one of them has good credit and we've got you know so we would go back and forth back and forth and then it, um, and, and every time I've ever been told no, whenever the under underwriters, you know, I get one of my brokers would come in and say, yeah, yeah, it was denied. And I go, well, why? Well, mm, they, they sent this. It's denied. I'm like, why was it denied? Like, that's what's important. Who I, you can get, you know, I don't care that it was denied. I need to know why we need to know what to do when we go to the next lender. How do we correct mm. this? Like, and I would say this all the time, like, like, I don't mind failing. 
you know, not trying is what I have an issue with. Mm. You, you, as long as you're trying, you know, that's fine. You can fail and fail and fail. I don't care. So, um, but you know, yeah, de definitely. I mean, I, I'm always wondering why, 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 what can we do to get around this? What can we do to get through this? What can we do to get over this? You know, there's gotta be a way here. How, what can we alter to make this work? There's a deal here. Um, I'm so I glad we're on this topic because I didn't ask a question I wanted to ask yesterday. You had mentioned um, that you learn things from movies sometimes and you had used schindler's list as an example but you had a freudian slip i think because you almost said shawshank redemption and my oh, question yeah. is please tell me were you thinking about ways to escape prison oh yeah i i, I one there's i have like two two movies that are my favorite like one is shawshank this is all before prison one was shawshank one was a movie called gattaca um wow okay that's a good movie Oh, it's a great movie, right? Well, I love the fact that he was unwilling to accept his plight in life, right? Mm. Like he was, despite everything was against him, he he wouldn't accept it. He knew there was a way to get to get to you know to become an astronaut. He just knew it, mm. and he did everything he could to make that you know to make that um, you know a priority or make that work. So, uh. Um, yeah, I definitely, you know, Shawshank, I love Shawshank. And, and when I first got to prison, so when I got to 26 years, my thought process was almost immediately was how quickly until they send me to a camp because camps don't have fences. Typically there are a few, you know, I always have to clarify stuff like that. You notice that when you get the comment section, you start to realize I got to start altering the way I talk because mm. people will constantly nitpick. So it's like, yes, are there camps out there in the United States that have fences? Yes, there's a couple. So typically there are camps. And what happens is you'll have 150, maybe 300 guys, and you'll have two COs, two correctional officers watching them. And they're in a separate building. So guys leave and come back, leave, leave all the time. So my thought process was, how long until they send me to a camp? And that was the first question I asked my counselor <laughs> when I, I got to the prison, <laughs> I got to the medium. She's like, okay. And she's going over my paperwork, this and this. And she goes, she said, um, you know, do you have any questions? I go, when can, how, how can I get myself to a camp? <laughs> and she was like, oh, wow. You know, like you really shouldn't be here at all. She said, you've the problem problem is you have so much time. So if you have more than 20 years to serve, you have to go to a, a, a medium. From 20 down to 10, you can go to a low. From 10 and under, you can go to a camp. And she said, I've seen them place people in camps with 12 years. Make an exception. She said, so honestly, Matt, she said, you are probably looking at about 10 years before you can go, go to a camp. And so my first thought was 10 years, I got 10 more years because I, I was adamant that if nothing changed, I would get to a camp and I would just leave, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I figured I would befriend someone, you know, you befriend someone, but just before you're going, you convince them to pick you up and you, you know, and have provisions for you right? Like clothes, mm. a little bit of money so that I could immediately go and steal someone's identity, get an ID in their name, kind of start my life over again. And, um, <laughs> but so I was at the low, I was at the medium for about three years and then I went to the low and, you know, that was like always in my, the back of my mind, but then I got my sentence cut and then I got it cut again. There was like, Oh, wow. I might actually I don't have to escape. This is, this is great. <laughs> not not as dramatic as Andy Dufresne, but I no, like I, that. I like that you were thinking about it. Yeah. Who told me the other day? Somebody told me the other day climbing through that stage. Somebody at Mythbusters or somebody said that climbing through the um, that tunnel that he would have died from the uh, uh, from all the excrement. Uh, you know the uh. the whatever it put off, they said that it would have killed him. He would have never been able to get more than 
whatever, a few hundred feet. It's like, why tell me that? I know. Like, I don't <laughs> like that's when Mythbusters is just like, OK, you're smart. I got yeah. it. That's, I don't want to know that. Don't I don't ruin that, that for me. Who knows? Anyway, he got to test yeah. it to find out for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to put those two guys. I'm willing to risk their life to find out if that's true. So, yeah. Uh, Is that it? Any no more questions? I'm, I feel like we turned the interview around on, on you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, <it's> just, <laughs> I really and I know. I know we're ahead. not like your typical guests. We don't have a criminal past, but uh, if you want. I could yeah. tell my inspection sticker story again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's. that's kinda, I know. It's fine. I love you're sweating. Oh, it's, so, so. <laughs> it's so. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, I, I, I it, it's so funny, too, because um, like I, I'm like knowing now what, you know, or you know, knowing what I know now in dealing with like law enforcement and stuff like, you know, before I just I, I had this this completely warped perception of law enforcement, you know, which and and now after, you know, you've been around like correctional officers and police officers and FBI and it, you realize like they're just they're just regular, you know, schmoes like everybody else. And so, um, uh it's, it's, I don't know. I don't know. I was just thinking, you, you know, well, what, if, you know if, what, if I do get pulled over for the inspection mm -hmm. sticker, I'm going to, I'm going to channel you. I'm going to be like, what would Matt Cox do in this situation? And <laughs> I said, are you telling me that my sticker fell off? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you <laughs> officer. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, listen, I had a Wait, guy the other day. <laughs> it's November. I, <laughs> I had a guy come in that come, come on uh, the other day and he said, you know, so the, the police came and, you know, my girlfriend and I were there and they, they raided my house and they sat me down. They said, well, you know, I guess, you know, why we're here. And, and I, I and it, you know, I, I jumped in and I said, I said, yeah, I do. My girlfriend's running an illegal steroid operation. I can't believe you guys <laughs> just showed up. I was going to turn her in myself. <laughs> you, know, you need to talk to her. I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you're here. That's not what he's doing, though. <laughs> My I girlfriend, thought... of course, she's like, oh, "You would do that. You would do that." <laughs> I, I always thought that uh, it would be really. Well, not fun, but if if the police ever knock on on my door for any reason, you know, whether they're looking for like a lost cat or something, I I'm gonna open the door and I'm gonna say, "Took you guys long enough," just to see what they say. <laughs> I've been calling. <laughs> I expected this day would come. Something like that. <laughs> could, you, could you imagine? Just all right. <laughs> Hold your hands. All right. Hands. They're behind. The, they're under the shed. I, I just... <laughs> That's great. I don't know, Matt. It's got to be some something of a, a a good feeling to know that if you if every if things ever got too hot, you could just leave. You could just All leave right. and take take another identity <laughs> and start over. You'd have to abandon your YouTube following and TikTok uh, page, might, but that might be what does it though. Like, <laughs> <True>. <laughs> you're right, huh? Now I've got a million subscribers. <laughs> yeah, and now that's your your vice. Must <laughs> is your followers. Um, oh man, you know, you know what I told my actually I've told this several times, but I, I was um, my my um probation officer was uh when they we were in the halfway house she she uh was questioning me you know they, they come they do like a preliminary talk with you before you leave the halfway house and you know we were talking and she's like so you know what are you planning on doing for work and i was like oh you know this and that and this and that. we were going back and forth back and forth and and she said something she she said well you know you're on like one of the highest custodies for probation you know so you've got to do you have to i'm going to come by your house randomly you have to do urine tests you have to do this you have to do a monthly statement you have to do she's going on and on i was like right 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 and she said um she said you know 
because you know the last time you were on probation you you stole one you know over a million dollars and i was like yeah <laughs> it's a bad time um and she was like she was like you know but you're all done with that and i was and i kind of went like that and she goes what is what do you mean and i was like well you know maybe and she goes what is maybe i said well I said, you mean like even a year from now, if I'm still living in someone's spare room and I can't pay my bills and I'm riding the bus? And she goes, yeah. And I go, I'm going to commit a massive, massive fraud and I'm going to leave the United States because that's, <laughs> that's where I went wrong last time. And she was like, she looked at me. It was so funny. I really thought that was the shock value was going to get her. And instead she went, she goes, you know, she said, I'm not as surprised at that as you might think. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, well, hopefully it doesn't come to that. She was like, yeah, hopefully it doesn't come to that. <laughs> Let's but, hope not. Yeah. But you know, I can't believe you said that. Oh, yeah. Well, but she can't do anything. You know, she, I'm all, listen, I'm already at highest custody. It's not like she's like, oh, I'm bumping you up. So what? So, <laughs> but I, I, you know, guys ask me, they're like, do you, do you ever, so do you ever, you know, do you ever think about fraud? I'm like, like every day, every <laughs> yeah. day I think about it. And, and I do, I do like, you know, I joke with my girlfriend that, you know, yeah, things are going good, but if they go bad, I go, yeah, there's always fraud. She's don't even play. Don't even joke about it. Don't even, <laughs> like, <laughs> man, it, it's out there. So, so yeah, it's not going to be a surprise to anybody. So <laughs> you're doing, you're doing everybody a favor by putting it out there. And I just realized that the last scene of the Netflix series about you will be <laughs> Tim and I, after you've disappeared again, Tim and I we'll receiving this clip. Tim and I, no, we're, we're going go, go to live in Bolivia. Yeah, we're going to receive like mortgage default letters in the mail and we're going to go. Ah! <laughs> It'll be like the scene in uh, in uh, um, Wrath or was it not Wrath of Khan or what the Star Trek where, where yeah. Kirk goes, you know, Khan! Yep. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, in the at the at the end of the American Greed episode, the Secret Service agent makes a comment about Matt about how there's like I want to say she says five million or six million. There's like six million dollars still unaccounted for in Cox's case, and we like that money back. And then the narr that the narration is you know it'll be a long time before Cox can go to his Cayman Island account. It's like, who said Cayman Island? What are you doing? You know, <laughs> so they, they do this whole thing. And as a result of that, my, my ex-wife, she used to come see me when I was locked up and she would make these cracks. Like, you know, I know, you know, I know you've got money out there. I know you've got money. I guess this, this, I go enough with, I'm not talking to stop, stop. And I, <laughs> so I always thought it'd be hilarious if you set up a camera and one day I pulled up to her driveway just after I got out of prison, got out, pulled a shovel out. She sees me. She goes, what are you doing? Nothing. Don't worry about it. I start digging in her front yard. <laughs> I, I pull up like a, a safety deposit box, throw the dirt in, throw it in the, my car, get in and then drive off. <laughs> and she was, what are you doing? <laughs> it was Nothing. in my the whole time. Don't you worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the least you know the better <laughs> yeah good time <clears throat> okay we're, we're, we're listen i feel like i've milked this for as much as i can get out of it unless you guys have something else no good no no this is this has been fun it's always fun uh chatting with you matt yeah we um yeah. oh you know it's so funny too is I, like i would love to do an I would love to talk to you about that, the the source that that story I wrote, but but I hate to even bring it up because uh, mention it because I hate it when guys are are like you know, hey, you should do this. Yes, yes, I need another project. Thank <laughs> you. Let me let, let me spend two weeks on a project because you think it'd be a good idea <laughs> for you. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> but um. Yeah, it's too bad. That's a that's a actually a really cool story too. Um, uh, and I have all these documents and everything. The problem is, I just don't think it's ever gonna be resolved. Even though, like, they know who did it, they know the whole thing. I just don't know what's gonna come of it. But a wild story. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it is. If you read the whole thing, it's just like you know the whole thing unravels in 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 the prison. 
So, mm -hmm. but um, look, if you guys ever come across anything, you ever want any, you know, want to, you know, come on the show and talk about a case or anything like that, yeah. like the more you can spread something around, you know, the better. Sounds yeah. great. Yeah. I think it's yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah. And vice versa too. If you ever want to uh, come back on crawl space, talk about anything, feel free. Lord All knows right. we can talk for two hours if we want. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, that's a huge plus. That's huge. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate you guys uh, watching. If you like the video, do me a favor and hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notified, share the video, leave me a comment. I respond to a bunch of the comments. Also, um, as I'm sure you will have realized by now, I have a Patreon account and I would love the support if you were so uh, you know inclined to do so. Uh, what else? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I have uh, several books out. They're all on Amazon. All the links are in the description box. And uh, so is my email if you want to send me an email. And I appreciate you guys watching. And thank you. And see you.